and today I'm going to be debuting a new series entitled Rock Art, in which we take a look at some of the world's finest artwork in rock, since I think the album cover is an often unappreciated format and is such a part of the music. When you think of a great album, you often just picture its artwork, and the artwork of an album can make you want to buy it, can even make, make you want to listen to it. It could just be something memorable and something wonderful to look at, and I think it deserves more credit than it gets. And today we're going to be looking at the artwork of In the Court of the Crimson King by King Crimson. I mean, their debut album is one of the most powerful musical statements ever recorded. The bombastic, electrifying, proto-metal riff of 21st century schizoid man ushering you into this epic prog journey to the grandeur and epic finale of In the Court of the Crimson King it takes a listener on a journey that at the time was revolutionary and unparalleled, that began the progressive rock movement, and to this day is still an incredible and highly critically acclaimed record. But just as striking as the music itself is the iconic artwork that adorns its cover, the bright red face screaming extending onto the back of the sleeve. No words to accompany on the album, nothing to tell you who the artist is or what tracks you can expect, because the cover just says it all. On the surface, it, looking at that face, you see feelings of anguish and sadness, alienation, panic, dread, fear, concern, and they just immediately spring to mind on the surface. Its power lies not in conveying one soul emotion, not in being angry or ecstatic, but in conveying such a wide multitude of frenzy, disturbing, and very dark emotions. So we're going to be really looking at this great piece of art, what inspired it, and also the piece that can be found in the inner gatefold we're going to be having a look, and also the artist himself, whose life I definitely find an important um, part of why this album is so impactful. Barry Godber is the man responsible for this creation, and he is often overlooked, with little often said about him, he's certainly not a famous artist, Yet this piece of work is just monumental, in my opinion, certainly, and I mean, I love the cover beyond words. Wikipedia certainly doesn't shine too much light on him, it just says the standard, he was a computer programmer and he died in February 1970 of a heart attack about well, less than a year, really, after the album's release, and that this was his only album cover. But this, to me, is really just not a satisfactory portrait of someone who's history and personality appears to be of importance to what is conveyed by this image. Looking further into it, it seems that Godber attended Chelsea Art College, where he became friends with future King Crimson lyricist Peter Sinfield, and also future King Crimson tour manager Dick Fraser. And Godber later joined these two in their day job, which was computer programmers. That's certainly what Sinfield did for a while before he joined King Crimson. It was at uh, English Electric Computers. And in their spare time, they would start plotting the identity for the band. And Godber designed Michael Giles' bass drum skins. He designed uh, the press kit, and in particular, this really cool concert poster printed on silver foil, which they sort of um, hands put around in London, which I think is a really nifty design, actually. And it would certainly have been pretty interesting at times, just like, what even is that? Peter Sinfield described Barry Godber as one of the most charming, beautiful, and face and spirit mischievous souls I've ever met. A comparison, well, a sort of Nick Drake but not as obviously profound and moody. I certainly have to say that I find the Nick Drake comparison to be an extremely interesting one, especially in the context of Barry's inspiration for the piece. According to Sid Smith, this piece was partly a self-portrait drawn from Godber's own visage as seen in a shaving mirror. And to be honest, to see such anguish and pain, such a terrifying image expressed in your own face, certainly seems reminiscent of some of the profound darkness that hangs over Nick Drake's music. I mean, Drake suffered um, depression, and his work certainly reflects that, and there seems to be a vibe like that here, something definitely dark, 
going on in the mind of Barry Godber. When the band was presented with this artwork, it was Barry Sinfield who brought it to Wessex Studios in Highgate, and Michael Giles refused to commit to it and doesn't ever seem to have done, to be quite honest, but the rest of the band and Fripp loved it. And to be honest, who knows how many covers Godber would have done for Crimson, maybe he would have been a regular contributor like Peter Sinfield. But all we have now is this iconic front cover and the inner sleeve, so let's take a look at the schizoid man himself. It has been stated by Fripp that this image is indeed the schizoid man, as in the song 21st century schizoid man. So I think maybe it might be worth establishing what actually a schizoid man really is. So I found a psychological definition of what schizoid personality disorder is, and it is characterised by a long-standing pattern of detachment from social relationships. So a person with schizoid personality disorder often has difficulty expressing emotions, and does so typically in a very restricted range, especially when communicating with others. Basically, in other words, a typical loner. Perhaps Godber recognised some of these characteristics in himself and when looking in the mirror and that the lyrics and the ideas presented, particularly in 21st century schizoid man, he was able to relate to, making him able to conjure such powerful imagery. But his own portrait in the mirror was not the only inspiration it appears for this piece. The painting certainly appears to bear similarities as alluded to by Sid Smith, with the poet-painter William Blake's um, painting Nebuchadnezzar. Not an easy thing to say, and this was done in 1795, so a long time ago. And in this picture we see Babylonian king who has grown mad with unbelief. The Blake biographer Alexander Gilchrist described the figure as having wild eyes full of sullen terror, the powerful frame losing semblance of humanity. And this painting certainly illustrates the irrational, uncontrolled, animalistic facet of humanity. And Nebuchadnezzar is also portrayed in the Bible in the Book of Daniel as a madman driven insane by his hubris, in other words, his pride. I would certainly be surprised, actually, if it turns out that Godba had never seen this picture, since the look in the fallen king's face certainly shares more than a passing resemblance with the face of the schizoid man. The emotion and madness appears similar, and one not as obviously distorted in this picture is certainly not necessarily the face of a normal person. And of course, Godba was distorted far more in the finished product. And the alienation from society and the look of utter despair stripping a man of all his sentience and rational thought, making him no more than a beast as he finds himself in a seemingly hell-like place, which appears in keeping with a lot of the themes that William Blake explored in his work. He drew many comparisons from Milton and Dante, and images of hell was certainly a theme of his work. And a schizoid man, at least to me, seems to represent this fall into an unimaginably dark state of emotions, he lets out his eternal scream. Now, if we go move on to the painting itself, it appears to depict a face without a head, with an unnatural looking composition of pink and purple watercolours. They're not looking too alien as to be sort of unrelatable, but yet different enough to just be flat out horrifying. His gaze firmly fixed to the right while the rest of his face um, faces the viewer, and you're immediately drawn to wonder at the horror unfolding next to him that's causing this immeasurable pain. And of course, as you flip open the gatefold, have it flat out looking at the full picture, you see him looking at his own flesh, spiralling out of control, possibly perpetually about to continue into this void, this ether that just seems to be a space-like state, and the man appears sort of unaware of well, how the hell this has happened, and how he could lose so much of himself. And Sid Smith, who I mentioned a couple of times already in this video, really is such a mine of King Crimson knowledge, his books on the subject are extensive and really interesting, described the painting in a really interesting way, I think that the schizoid man is in fact a victim of man's inhumanity, which at the time would have specifically been the war in Vietnam, coupled with the failures and betrayal of the establishment. Though Smith offers a further link to Nepukadnezar, who in a historical context ruled the Babylonian
Babylonian Empire and conquered Jerusalem, destroying Solomon's temple and exiling the Jews. And that perhaps the man here is not necessarily the victim of a military industrial complex, but perhaps the perpetrator, who as a result is suffering a psychological and spiritual collapse. But the great thing truly about this painting is there's no right way to interpret it, there's no obvious thing that you can really see in it. It's so easy to project yourself and your own feelings onto the schizoid man. And while I do find Sid Smith's ideas on it rather compelling, perhaps as Paul Hegarty and Martin Halliwell offer in Beyond and Before Progressive Rock since the 1960s, that schizoid man is the alienated victim of the powerful figure inside the gatefold, the Crimson King. As you turn over the gatefold to the original vinyl, if you're lucky to have one, or maybe a repress, again if you're lucky to have one because damn, today they can be quite expensive, you enter, it seems, the court of the Crimson King. Now myself, for the longest time, I actually thought this figure was the Moonchild, to be quite honest, because, well, he has a moon-like face, and it's like, oh, that's, that's the Moonchild, yeah, Moonchild. No, uh, it seems to have been confirmed by Fripp that he is indeed the Crimson King. And what less striking than his counterpart image, it still has great power and depth to it. The figure appears in keeping more with the time, the late 60s, the psychedelic revolution, you know, coming after the summer of 67 and the social freedom of the 60s. But he's sort of a, a hippie fellow with a wide head and a great smile, definitely reminiscent of sort of the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland, which is certainly a trippy uh, book to say the least. What makes this face more than just another 60s acid trip, I think has been surmised by Fripp in 1995, that if he covered a smiling face, the eyes appear to reveal this incredible sadness. I certainly also find the figure to be a dominating and powerful one. His hand gestures, particularly with the outstretched left hand, seem to imply a hold over the schizoid man on the cover that the Crimson King is perhaps the puppet master pulling the strings. He is the one that can damn someone to eternal pain, eternal suffering. And that perhaps as expressed in his eyes, he does it to make others share in his misery. He enjoys the power, but it has also been a great burden upon him, and he has suffered greatly himself. But again, this is merely my interpretation, and you may see this completely differently, and that's cool. Because no one other than Barry, who sadly is dead, knows what the painting means, or whether it really means anything at all. So what became of the artwork? Well, it originally hung on the wall at 63A Kings Road in London in broad daylight, and as the colours began to drain and fade, Fripp decided to just take it for himself, and I believe it's now stored in the Discipline Global Mobile World Central. I'm not sure what that is either. But I'll end the video with a quote from Greg Lake about what makes this so great. He says, I'll tell you what makes it a great cover. First of all, it's a great cover because it's a great record. Secondly, it's a kind of appropriate picture, certainly for Schizoid Man. But thirdly, the guy died after doing it. It's kind of a primal scream before the guy died. It's the stuff legends are made of. How many more properties can an album cover have going for it than that? And it's so true. Godber's short-lived legacy lives on, and I think it really truly deserves to be appreciated in its own right, not just as the cover adorn in one of the most influential albums in rock music, but just as a wonderful piece of art. This has been The Album Man. Thanks for watching, I hope you like this series. If you don't, please tell me, and, you know, feedback, etc. If you want me to do more, or never ever do it again, please tell me. And long live rock and roll.